students, faculty, and staff of Forsyth Technical Community College, I want to welcome all of you today for a very special event. We have a, uh, a lot of special guests uh, with us today, and I would like to recognize all the uh, elected leaders and community partners that we have, uh, our uh, uh, partners in higher education. I know a number of our community college presidents are here as well as uh, staff and, and uh, leaders from the North Carolina Community College system. But uh, on behalf of, the, of our time, I, I won't try to introduce, uh, I would introduce the whole audience if I did that. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. I do want to recognize uh, uh, one person who's with us. Uh, Geraldo de los Santos is with us, Associate Director of the uh, Lee for Innovation Community College. And, and, uh, Gerardo is here from uh, Phoenix, Arizona, to be with us today. Welcome, welcome him. <laughs> Congressman Burr, thank you very much for being here, and thank you so much for helping to arrange this special day for us. I also want to thank a uh, member of our Board of Trustees, DeWitt Rhodes, for his assistance in, in putting this day together. Thank you, DeWitt. I hope, I hope you enjoyed uh, the music we had for a little entertainment as we were waiting uh, for the president. I want to thank uh, Naomi's Fancy for the music that they provided. We, all, we also have had uh, support today from uh, American Refreshments and Sarah Lee Branded Apparel, who uh, provide support, and we thank them for their support. Our platform guest today, uh, I'll briefly introduce, uh, to my far right is uh, Dr. Lucas Shalua, who is the coordinator of the biotechnology program at Forsyth Tech. And then we have three of our students with us. First is Scott Heiner. Uh, Scott is a student at Forsyth Tech. Sandy Moser. And uh, Jan Robertson uh, is one of our other students who's with us today. We're also pleased to have two of our very important uh, community partners with us. Uh, Dr. Richard Dean, who is the CEO of Wake Forest Health Sciences, with us. Dick, welcome. And Phil Dean, who is the president of Idea Alliance, which is the managing organization for the Piedmont Triad Research Park, is with us. Bill, thank you for, for being here. And of course, we're honored to have the president of the United States, George W. Bush, with us. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, Gary, first I want to thank you very much for being a host. It's not easy to host the president and his entourage. <laughs> but uh, we have an interesting opportunity to have a, a discussion for the country. It's a discussion about the importance of education and jobs. It's a discussion about the importance of making sure the education system is flexible enough to help train people for jobs which exist today and will exist tomorrow. So I really want to thank you for hosting. This is, this is an important dialogue. Uh, you know, the economy is uh, obviously uh, taking its toll in parts of North Carolina. Uh, the manufacturing sector has been hit. The textile industry has been hit. People have lost work. And yet in other sectors of the economy here in North Carolina are growing. And we got to make sure we're able to match the skills and talent and drive of uh, North Carolina citizens with the jobs of the future. And a great place to do that is at the community college. Community colleges here in North Carolina and all around the country. And that's really what we're here to herald. So I want to thank you for giving me the chance to visit. I look forward to hearing our panelists. I want to thank you all for taking time out of your day to, to come and help uh, educate the country about uh, this fantastic program and efforts you've got right here. So, uh, Dr. Green, you're a good man for hosting this, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs> Mr. President, I'd like to give you a little information about the college uh, to start with, maybe as a context uh, for our discussion. Uh, Forsyth Technical Community College has an enrollment of about 7,300 uh, credit students. We also serve over 20,000 students a year in our continuing education program, and many of our job training uh, programs are in that uh, area. Our average age of our students is about 28 years old, which is a little different than the, uh, the typical uh, college or university. We have uh, a lot of 18 and 19 year olds, but we've got a lot of 35 and 40 year olds that make up our, uh, our student population. We now have over 140 instructional programs at the college many of which are preparing people for the workforce, the workforce of tomorrow, 
and preparing students who want to transfer to colleges and universities around the area. Uh, as you know, as we talked briefly about, uh, there are several federal programs that are very important to us. Uh, the Pell Grant Program is very important. Uh, the uh, Trade Adjustment Act and Workforce Investment Act funds support many of our students in their efforts to retrain and prepare themselves for, for new jobs. The Perkins Vocational Technical Program helps build the, the capacity within the institution. And with as many new students as we have in com having coming to us now, that ability to, to grow the institution and the capacity is, is very critical through those Pell funds. And we thank you very much and thank the, your uh, administration for your support of those programs. Uh, the uh, biotech program is the program we want to talk about a little bit today. And biotechnology is one of the real new economic drivers in our economy in Winston-Salem. And it's one of the emerging technologies nationally that's helping to provide a new generation of jobs for, uh, for our recovery economy now. Uh, we have the largest associate degree program in North Carolina after having only been in existence for 14 months with this program. So it's growing rapidly because people see the opportunity for new jobs here. Uh, we have been very fortunate uh, to have a grant from the Department of Labor under the uh, High Growth Industries Initiative, and that's helped us to jumpstart this program to provide opportunities to students as you see today. Uh, and we're very appreciative of your Department of Labor for that uh, support. Uh, to start us off, uh, Lucas, uh, would you tell the President maybe a little more about our uh, program? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, our program was uh, approved last year by the North Carolina Community College System to be able to give the associate degree in biotechnology. And our major emphasis is to make sure that um, we train the people to have the competencies which are needed in the life sciences and biotechnology fields. Uh, our focus basically is to uh, make sure that uh, those companies which are downsizing at the moment because of the economic trends, we take their employees, we train them into this new emerging field in biotechnology and make sure that we prepare them uh, to be able to fit in the, in the marketplace. Uh, we also try to meet the current demands in life sciences and biotechnology uh, by making sure that we train these, uh, uh, these employees and our graduates are well prepared to get into these working places and be able to, uh, be able to work properly. And uh, we are not doing this by ourselves. There are the five area community colleges which we have uh, signed collaboration uh, with them. And what happens is they will enroll students for us. And when they enroll these students for us, they train them with introductory subjects like mathematics, English, general biology, chemistry. And uh, from there, on their second year, they will come to our college and we train them into more specific uh, uh, specialty courses like cell biology, uh, cell culture, immunology, research, uh, together with um, uh, research uh, measurements, th things like that, which really need a lot of sophisticated uh, equipment, so sophisticated labs. And we're really thankful to the Department of Labor for giving us a grant because uh, we can jumpstart the program at the moment and uh, we, are, we, are, we are well equipped to do that because specialty courses can be a bit expensive to run. And uh, we, we take ourselves as a central point whereby we can train fairly expensive and fairly high-skilled labs. We can do that in our labs. And we are thankful to the partners which we have that include the members of biotech community together with the members of academia within the, within the triad area, they are providing quite a lot, a lot of support to the program, making sure that we are within the, uh, within, the, uh, within the lines or within the guidance or the things which are supposed to be done. Many times uh, it's something to train a graduate and it's something else to make sure that he fits within the, within the marketplace. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to ask. Uh, it's very important for this type of education to be demand-driven. That is correct. I remember the old days in Texas, 
Uh, they paid job training programs. They really didn't care whether the jobs actually existed. All they want to do is make sure you train. So you end up with like 1,500 hairdressers for 25 jobs. And so my question to you is, uh, first of all, let me make it clear on the grant. We're, what we're talking about is a $754,000 grant uh, to Forsyth Tech. Congressman gets a lot of credit uh, for arranging this because we were very aware that certain sectors of the country were, were, were losing jobs. The job, the job uh, mix is shifting. The, con the economy, as it grows, uh, sometimes there's a different shift in the type of jobs available. You hear a lot of talk about productivity increases. You mentioned productivity increases. A lot of the manufacturing sector is seeing job loss because the worker is more productive. In other words, an hour of uh, of, of a person's time yields more product. And unless demand outstrips productivity, it's a pressure on the job base. And the, so, but, but, but productivity increases, by the way, are going to mean higher paying jobs. It's important for our economy to, to have productivity increases because in the long run, it makes a lot of sense. In the short run, it creates some dislocation for workers. We're going to hear from some in a minute. And the job grant program recognized that this part of the world had had some job losses, and yet there were some wonderful workers and wonderful people who were anxious to be able to employ their skills in a, in a field that was actually growing. And so my question to you is, is that as you, and, and, and the doc here, as you uh, have a curriculum change, explain to people how it is demand-driven curriculum change. In other words, a, a curriculum that's actually relevant to the job base here in the local communities. Uh, the good thing about the way the program was established is that most of the biotechnology industry and the risk biomedical research leaders, these were the ones who came together and institute the establishment of the curriculum. And they, uh, they did the job assessment and they analyzed the, uh, the demand of this particular type of a field and they contacted us and together with the college leadership, we put together the curriculum. And up till now, they serve as the advisory committee members to this curriculum to make sure that we adjust ourselves as the market is adjusting itself. That's very wise. Thank you. <laughs> Scott, uh, you come out of the uh, textile industry in the area. Of course, we've had a lot of changes in this region in textiles. Could you tell us a little bit about how you came for Site Tech? Okay, I worked for us as a supervisor for a textile company for almost 15 years. Um, with a part of reconstructing, um, I became a displaced worker. Um, <clears throat> the economy in North Carolina, with the textiles, the furniture, the tobacco, and the demand for that has totally decreased. So I wanted to make sure I found a field that was strong. So I got on the internet, a lot of research, a lot of study, and I actually found Biotech. So I called for Slide Tech and asked them if they had any kind of program. Of course, they recommended me to Dr. Shalou. <clears throat> As you can tell, it's a fascinating, fascinating field. Very, very interesting. Um, I did get lucky. I went back, and the field actually goes with a TAA program, which is the Trade Adjustment Act, um, <clears throat> which was approved by the, well, the president has a lot to do with. So, <clears throat> <clears throat> so what I really would like to thank the president for is actually, I mean, for me and for the other displaced workers, he's actually given us a chance to go back and get another career in a fast growing environment. First of all, I thank you for the credit, but you get the credit. See? You're the person who made the decision that you want to do something with your life. I can't make that decision for you. That's your call to make, and you get the credit. And for that, I really appreciate that a lot. Let me say something about it. Uh, one of the interesting innovations, and it's an important innovation, is these uh, one-stop centers that the community college system is plugged into. A one-stop center is a place where a person such as Scott can go and say, uh, I, I've got this interest, what's available? You can call it up on the web or you can use the high-tech world to help bring information to your, to your screen. And the one-stop centers are really a kind of an innovative idea to allow for people to not only find uh, what may be available, or was they able to look at, uh, judge demand for jobs themselves, and say, oh, look, people are looking for work here, this industry is looking for work here, 
but it also helps people find job training programs. It's very important for the community colleges to be plugged into these one-stop centers because then they become the bridge to the job, become the kind of the help create the skill set necessary for someone to access the job. And as well, one-stop centers have got like resume help. And, and so for those out there who are interested in doing what Scott and the others up here have done, I suggest you go to your regional one-stop centers. You'll find a lot of help. The job of the people there is to help you find, uh, match your interests or your inclinations with jobs that actually exist. I appreciate you bringing it up, Scott. You, you made the decision, you made the decision to go back to school, which isn't easy. Correct. Particularly for an old guy like you. And, uh, <laughs> well, there is a lot of, of government help out there. You just have to go find it. Yeah. And I, like I said, I really appreciate it being out there. Well, I appreciate you saying that. We, 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 as the economy changes, as technology changes, the slowest part of change is the workforce. And we just got to understand that we got to make sure our workers, who are the most productive in the world, the hardest working people in the world, the finest people in the world, have the skills necessary uh, to, to, to move on with their lives. And, and I appreciate the example you set. Mr. President, you may, you may be interested in knowing that we have a one-stop center here at Forsyth Tech located in this building. And so people can, well, can come right here. <laughs> Sandy, you come out of one of our other manufacturing uh, uh, industries. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about maybe your career plans and, and educational goals at this time? Okay, I um, worked for a company for 10 years. Um, we made electrical connectors. I worked my way up to the quality department. I loved my job. Well, it went overseas. So I had to find a field that I wanted to be in. Like the medical field wasn't my thing. So I, like Scott, did a lot of research and the biotechnology is so versatile that it just, you can do anything. When you get done, there's opportunity everywhere. So like what, what, what interests you now? I mean, as you come in here, do you have a, uh, have you made up your mind exactly what you want to do? Or are you open-minded as you go through the curriculum they developed or? They have quality technicians and that's right up my alley. Yeah. So if somebody's listening right now and they say biotechnology field, what, how, how would you describe that? Give, give, give somebody a sense for what I mean. I'm sure there's a lot of people frightened that biotechnology is a long word. It sounds, <laughs> they may say, well, I don't know if I if smart enough to be in biotechnology. It sounds too sophisticated to be in biotechnology. It didn't frighten you. Why? Because um, I was thinking pharmaceuticals yeah. and things like that, and they're going to teach me. Uh, they're, you know, they're going to teach me what I need to know. They're not going to let me out of there until I know it. <laughs> and how's your, right. how's, your, how's, your, how's your education being paid? Um, through the TAA. Yeah, good, good. A TAA is a program like the Pell Grant program. Uh, the good doctor here mentioned Pell Grants. It's, uh, people ought to take a look at Pell Grants. Uh, many of the community college students in our country are, have, have their education funded by Pell Grants. Uh, we've dramatically increased the funding of Pell Grants it's up to about $12.7 billion now on an annual basis, which means people can be able to find a grant. These are grants, not loans, by the way. That's why they're called Pell Grants. Otherwise, it would be known as Pell Loans. <laughs> and, uh, but, but the budget's up quite dramatically over the last couple of years by 45%. The reason I say that is it's important for people to know, as both our friends here have mentioned, that there is a way to make sure that you get your, your education is funded if you work hard, if you look hard. There's money available, and that's important for people to know. Thank you. Good job. Jan, your, uh, your educational program is a little bit different. You're in our medical transcription uh, program. Uh, can you tell the president what uh, your program has meant to you? Um, it helped it's for uh, when you go, like, into a doctor's office or something you get to uh, dictate what the doctor says and put it on the computer and then you get to put it in the file for the, the patient or whatever so they can understand them. Have you ever seen them write? Do you understand what they write? Yes, I have. Dick, Dick would you some, like to respond some, to that? <laughs> some people say my writing is worse than the doctor's. But I won't take it personally. So, so they need a little help. <laughs> uh, tell us, what, why are you, what were you doing before you came in? I was in a textile plant, and it went overseas. And I wanted to get to better myself, so I went to the medical field. Your okay. mother? Yes. How old was your child? Five. Single mom? Yes. You got the toughest job in America. 
Yes. Yeah, you do. That's good. Uh, and so, have you started class here? Yes, this fall. You making all A's? Not quite, but I'm getting there. <laughs> People are listening. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you're studying medical transcription. Yes. And are you good on the computer? I'm getting better. That's good. So that's part of the curriculum. Yes. And so what has happened here is that they've come and they've helped this uh, education institution develop a curriculum that is actually practical. So you believe that once you finish the curriculum, you'll be able to walk right out and sign up for work. Uh, yes, and also it helps you where you can do it at your own, at your home. Oh, good. So, so you can yes. do your first job, yeah. most important job, which is to be a mother. Yes. And then be a student. Yes. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank you. How's your, how's your kid done? Learning yes. to read? Oh, yes. <laughs> That's the most important thing you can do right now is teach your child. Get them to read more and they watch TV. Sorry to all the TV cameras. <laughs> Good job. Dick is head of uh, Wake Forest Health Sciences. You're certainly probably at this time the major employer in for biotechnology for technicians and, and others in our area, but one of, one of many. Could you talk a little bit about the, the workforce in, in biotech and, and the, the demands that, that, that you see as an employer uh, in biotechnology? Thank you, Gary. Uh, first of all, welcome to Winston-Salem again, Mr. President. Uh, as you can see, we have a terrific workforce here uh, witnessing the three folks here, and it's a matter of having them have the opportunity to be re-educated in a direction of our future, which for our city is, in fact, biotechnology. Uh, the medical center is the largest employer in the community at this point, and we are in a strategic investment in growing a biotechnology-based economy around our research mission. Uh, so we are, if you will, the end recipient of what you all are providing to the community college system, which provides the opportunity for, re for job retraining of individuals such as today. So we're deeply appreciative for the commitment to, from your administration for that because it, we are the ones most dependent upon that. Uh, we have worked quite closely uh, with uh, Forsyth Tech to create a curriculum that will fit into the jobs that are in fact on the market and will be. Uh, and since it is evolving and people keep asking us where are we gonna get all these people for the jobs that we are predicting we will be creating, they are sitting right here with us today, uh, thanks to the retraining programs. Well, I appreciate you bringing that up. I, I, we had a recent report out. It's, uh, it's the beginning of good news for job seekers. Uh, over the last three months, the economy, the entrepreneurs, the private sector, and, and others have driven the job base up uh, by 285,000 jobs, new jobs, which is good. So we're seeing some beginning to brighten up for people looking for work, which is positive. Uh, and, and therefore, we must make sure that people are trained for jobs that exist. How long have you been involved? How did this happen? How did this collaborative effort happen, Doc? Between well, there has been a uh, long-term collaboration between the, the healthcare system of our community and Forsyth Tech, and they have been a, the major supplier of, of all of the technicians, uh, both in healthcare delivery and radiology technicians at all, as well as our workforce of research technicians. Uh, the issue at this point is, is that we are in a rapid expansion mode, uh, transferring our job market from textiles, tobacco, as that shrinks right. into biotechnology. So we have a deep personal interest in the success of the program because it will drive our ability to succeed. And by the way, as these jobs get more sophisticated, in other words, the, the, the training level is, is higher, no question about it, but it pays better. And that's what productivity increases do in a society. As our society, particularly North Carolina economy, shifts from textiles to, you know, biotechnology, the pay gets better. And, and all we've got to do is bridge from the, from the tech, textile sector to the biotechnology sector with smart education practices. And that's what we're here talking about. It require, a smart education system requires a, co a community college which is flexible in their curriculum. If you're rigid, this good man here wouldn't be designing a curriculum. If they were rigid, they wouldn't be listening to the employers of the community say, listen, this is what we need. We need this kind of person or that kind of person. And uh, the reason I'm here is because this is a model for others to follow. 
in other parts of the country, there's also workers being displaced. And yet there's great hope and opportunity because there's wonderful job opportunity, so long as the training facilities are modern and active and, and not rigid. And uh, I want to thank you for understanding that, and I want to thank you for listening to people that are, you know, that are looking for workers. But they're not looking for just the average worker, they're looking for a trained worker. And so therefore job training programs are essential. Government spends about $15 billion a year on job training programs. I've got to tell you, though, we need a little help from the Congress, Congressman, to make sure that there's some, <laughs> there's some flexibility, not on how much money we spend, but how we spend it. Because these job training programs, you, he listed about three of them already, and for every job training program, there's kind of a, a government prescription with it, which means that the more prescriptive programs are, the less flexible they are. And the less flexible job training money is, uh, it makes it very difficult to be able to meet the needs of the local community. And therefore, I'm trying to work with Congress, Doc, to make sure that these monies coming out of Washington are able to you know, have, enough, have as few a strings attached as possible so that the states and the local community colleges can apply that money to meet the needs of the, acts of the local employers. And then we'll be able to say for certain that the job training initiatives are meeting the needs. Yeah, but thanks for, thanks for being an entrepreneur. Well, it's their pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, I think that's a, uh, that's a very important point. Uh, community colleges nationally really are sort of the rapid response team yeah. for, uh, for job retraining and, and for, for growing new jobs because it's based on preparation and, and education and it has to be tied to the local community. And I, and I have to give Dick Dean a lot of kudos for the work that he gave and, and others within Wake Forest and within the research park to help us design a program that's tailored to the needs of Winston-Salem. And uh, the needs are different in different communities, as, as you've noted. And it's the community colleges that can be flexible enough to adjust to those needs in communities around the nation. Uh, Bill, you, you've got a great opportunity and uh, an exciting time right now in developing our uh, Piedmont Triad Research Park. And uh, you, know, you all had a great announcement yesterday of a tissue engineering uh, team now that's coming to Wake Forest from Harvard. Uh, which is very exciting for all of us. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you see the issues of workforce development in the development of the research park specifically. Sure, Gary. Uh, President, uh, what you said is, is kind of like uh, we relate to the research park. We like to call it one-stop innovation, where we're building companies that will employ these uh, people in the future and looking at the biotech. Today, uh, the community is engaging in a very aggressive program to build a research park in downtown Winston-Salem uh, that prepares ourselves for the future where we can act as the seedbed or the catalyst, if you will, for new company uh, startup and development from what we call the lab to the marketplace of technology where these companies can grow and develop and create these jobs. And you're right that the training and development of that is the most critical component uh, in developing these technology uh, uh, industries as we know them. And as we look at biotechnology, and I was looking at some information uh, with the bio industry, and we looked at from the year 2000 to 2002, uh, the bio industry uh, grew about 12% annually in job creation. And these all came from very small companies. And I think that's one of the things we need to think about as we grow and collect collectively build research companies. These are small companies and they, they grow and they prosper, but uh, the greatest growth is in this area. Innovation is part of the growth and it takes great minds doing the innovation in the process. So the education and development is a very critical part to the development of the research park and the structure. And we thank you for the, the programs and our local congressmen and senators that work hard to help us build that infrastructure and get it in place. Without the federal support, it's very difficult for research and innovation to move forward. So we thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, the job of the government is to make sure that the entrepreneurial spirit of America is strong, uh, to make sure that uh, people feel comfortable in taking risk, that they're willing to start a small business and grow it to a big business. And one of the interesting aspects of making sure the entrepreneurial uh, spirit is strong is tax policy. And there's been a lot of talk, you've heard I'm sure, talk about the tax relief. Uh, hopefully you've seen some of it in your pockets like increasing that child credit for your five-year-old. <laughs> but what's interesting is that most small businesses are, are sole proprietorships or subchapter S corporations. That's when they're startups. I'm sure you 
seen that here in, in North Carolina. And as a result, when you these, these, these are companies that pay tax at the individual income tax rate, so that when you cut taxes on the individual, you're also providing capital inf uh, infusion into small businesses. And one of the very important things for our government to do is to also understand there needs to be certainty in the tax code. If you're a planner, an entrepreneur in any field, you've got to know that the tax policy today is likely to be the tax policy tomorrow, because uncertainty creates uh, difficult to plan and therefore makes it difficult to, for people to hire. And so one of the things I'm going to ask Congress to do is make sure all this tax relief we pass is permanent. See, it goes away. She, unfortunately, is going to have to pay, uh, receive less money in her child credit if they don't make the tax relief permanent. The small business owner, if they don't make the, the tax relief permanent, will have to pay a um, inheritance tax or a debt tax on the business they've created, which, uh, which I don't think is fair. I think it should only be taxed once, not twice. Uh, the marriage penalty relief is uh, is uh, it's going to go away. And it's important that there be certainty in order to make sure this economy continues to grow. And I want to uh, thank you for bringing up the entrepreneurial spirit. That's the thing that makes America such a wonderful place. The kind of place where people, if you have a dream, are able to realize your dream. That applies not only to the business owner, the person coming to the research triangle, the person who thinks they've got a better idea than their neighbor and is willing to put a little something out there, time and capital on the line. It also applies to our workers. People have got their own dreams, their own set of dreams, the dream of making sure the child grows up in a, in a wonderful little comfortable, peaceful household. And uh, our job in the government is to help people realize the dreams. That's really what it is. We can't make people dream, but we can help people once they start to dream. And uh, I, I thank you all for the compliments on the government, but the compliments really belong here. See, you're doing what needs to be done. And that's why I've got such wonderful optimism about our country. I'm very optimistic about the fact that we'll keep the peace. Very optimistic about the fact that people will find work. Because there's a wonderful spirit here in America. I met this guy right there. See, put your hand up. He's a volunteer firefighter. Well, not you, Burr. <laughs> He's a volunteer firefighter. He came out to the airport to say hello. It's an interesting concept, isn't it? Volunteer firefighters people volunteering to put their line, lives on the line in order to save lives. I recently went out to California, explained it to him when I was at the airport. Uh, a lot of people on the front lines of the fire out there were volunteers. The reason I bring that up is uh, it, it should remind us uh, uh, that the strength of the country is not our military, it's not our pocketbooks, it's the heart and soul of people. And the entrepreneurial spirit is the strength of the country, the willingness for people to volunteer in the fire department is the strength of the country. And once you realize how strong this country is in spirit, you can't help but be optimistic about the future. Uh, thank you for having me here, Doc. Listen, I want to thank you all for sharing your stories. It's not easy to stand up in front of all these cameras, I know. <laughs> all of the cameramen are fine people. Uh, but it, it, you were able to help, help us make a point that people who have lost work should have hope that with a little initiative, a little ingenuity, little drive, uh, there's help for you. Uh, the economy's growing, new jobs are being created, and uh, we, 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 there's, there's an opportunity. And I hope you seize it. I hope you seize it because there's uh, a wonderful, wonderful future ahead for, for people who may, may at this moment think their days are, the, the future's a little dark. And we've got three citizens right up here who are willing to see the, can see that bright light. So thanks for coming. Mr. President, you. thank you. Thank you all for coming.